is Shatrugna. Shatrugna is one of the, the four sons of Dasarath. And on Ram Nomi, we heard some of that procedure that was followed by Dasarath in order to have sons after 60,000 years, 353 wives, no sons, but compliments of Rishi Sringa and his successful performance of Yajna. He had four sons. And Shatrugna was one of those four sons. There were three principal queens, and Shatrugna had a brother. Bharata was the son of Kaikeyi, Ram was the son of Koshalya, and there were two more brothers. They were sons of. Sumitra. So though Bharata was the son of Kaikeyi, Shatrugna had a particularly dedicated, singularly focused service mood towards Bharata. The circumstance was that Bharata, at Kaikeyi's request or suggestion, had gone to see his mother's family, her parents. And because Bharata left, Shatrugna left. So this whole intrigue with Kaikeyi and Ram should be banished, all of that happened when Bharata was gone and Shatrugna was gone because Shatrugna was with Bharata because he was very attached to or loyal to or had strong mood of devotion to that particular brother and that we'll hear some more about as we go along so from two different sources we heard this already we're hearing it again one of those sources is Vishnu Dharmotara it's described that the four brothers are manifestations of Vasa, Dev, Sankarshan, Pradumna, and Aniruddha. Shatrugna being the manifestation of Aniruddha. And in the Padma Purana, it speaks differently. Ramachandra, incarnation of Narayana, and the others, Shesha, Chakra and Shanka of Narayana, Lakshman, Bharata, and Shatrugna, Shesha, Chakra, Shanka. So those are two. We, we went over this several times. Now we're doing it again. If this is right, then that's wrong. If that's right, then this is wrong. So how can they both be right? There's different ways it can be reconciled. And in this particular case, Baladev Vidyabhusan has concluded, this is his commentary on this discrepancy, this Kalpa Beda term. Kalpa means Deya Brahma, Kalpa. There are different meanings of Kalpa, but Kalpa, Deya Brahma. So Kalpa Beda, in one day a Brahma, it's this, in another day of Brahma, it's that, just different days of Brahma being described in two different scriptures. So they're both right. The reconciliation is different days of Brahma. So sometimes you'll hear this and sometimes you'll hear that. And they're both right. Different days of Brahma. Now this terminology is very much favored by Sri Vaishnava Acharyas, and there are many, many references I've been making to their commentaries because they like Ramayana like we like Srimad Bhagavatam. 
So this Sheshatvam is one of those terms. We heard the Sheshatvam, where there's the we, Ramanujacharya gave a definition. Anybody remember his definition of Shesha? One's existence is for the glorification of another. That's it. That's the, the Shesha and the Sheshi. Shesha Tvam was a characteristic of Lakshmana. Sheshatva means service towards someone. And more specific, according to Ramanujacharya, their, their existence is to give glory to someone. Shesha. So that's Lakshman towards Lord Ramachandra. Then there's Sheshatvam of two classes. So listen carefully because Shatrugna falls in the second category. Bhagavat Sheshatvam and Bhagavata Sheshatvam. They sound very similar, but Bhagavata is what in relation to Bhagavan. Bhagavan, just like the, the Bhagavatam is the Bhagavata, Bhagavat Purana. So there's two kinds of service to the person Bhagavat and the book Bhagavat. But that's the book and the person, they're the same. And then there's the servant of Bhagavat. That's Bhagavata. It's just a Sanskrit rule. But Shatrugna had this very single, singular Shesha mood towards one who is the devotee of Bhagavan at Bharata. So, Lakshmana, Bhagavat, Sheshatvam, Shatrugna, Bhagavata, Sheshatvam. And in Sri Vaishnavism, as, as in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, service to the devotee of the Lord is considered by the Lord to be even greater than service to the Lord. Yes? Service to the devotee. It's, 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 it's a manner of, it's a matter of humility, but it's also a matter of knowing what's, what's pleasing to the person. It's just like, you may, you may say something very nice to mother or father, but in the presence of mother and father, you say something nice to the daughter or son. It's even more pleasing to mother and father to, to hear that service rendered or the a, a compliment or appreciation of the son or daughter. It wins the heart of the parent even more than their appreciation is their children's appreciation. It's just very simple. So Krishna is like that too. And Ramachandra is like that too. So he, from the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas, Shatrugna, although the spotlight often goes to Lakshmana, much more than Shatrugna, from a from a devotional perspective, Shatrugna is in the even more appreciated position. So we're spending time with Shatrugna. Now, complementing Sheshatvam is this one. Para, para, para tantriyam. This was Bharata, Bharata, feeling dependent upon. It doesn't mean he didn't do service, but it's a particular quality or characteristic of an individual feeling completely dependent. And Bharata was like that towards Ramachandra. So Lakman Sheshatvam. Bharata Para Tantriyam or Par Tantriyam. And Shatrugna was a combination of both. The, he also had dasyatvam, total submission. We'll hear some more as we go forward. Total submission towards Bharata. Here's that reference from Ramanujacharya's definition of shesha. We saw this yesterday. We're seeing it again. 
the author, that's the one that's being quoted, is Vedanta Sheshika. If you remember from yesterday. Vedanta Sheshika, along with Govindaraj, are two of the most well-known, celebrated, and appreciated commentators on Ramayana. Vedanta Deshika wrote a book, a collection of glorifications of Ramach 1,000 glorifications of Ramachandra's padukas, what went on the throne in place of him, so meaning non different than him. So it's glorification of him by glorification of his padukas. And I received, because I don't know anything about this, but there's a devotee that does know a lot about it. He shared this with me. It's from his book, verse 18.1 which reads, Sri Ramanuja's definition of Vedarta Sangraha, in, excuse me, in Vedanta, Vedarta Sangraha, Shesha is one who, by his or its very nature, exists to promote the glory of another. So that's a quality of Lakshman towards Ram, and that's a quality of, of Shatrugna towards Bharata. And we'll bear that in mind as we go along because it's just, it's a trait of this, this particular person we're speaking about, Chitrugna. One of the meanings, very special meaning of Chitrugna is the slayer of enemies because this name was given by Vashishta at the time of his birth and sure enough, he slayed Love and Asura, slayer of an enemy. We'll, we'll hear the story. But it also has uh, a hidden meaning or not so explicit meaning, and that is he, Shatrugna, also had bhakti towards Ram, but he had to put that bhakti towards Ram in another position so that his bhakti towards Bharata could supersede or excel or eclipse his bhakti towards Ram. So that's what the explanation says. For his Bhagavata bhakti, his Bhagavat bhakti had to subside somewhat. So that it was because of his principle, we heard this word yesterday, karuna, no, no, mukya characteristic, primary characteristic was his mood of service to Bharata. And so then this, excuse me, secondary was a service to Bharata, but the secondary took the prominent position. Shatrugna stands higher this is Sri Vaishnava commentary. Shatrugna stands higher compared to both Lakshmana and Bharata because he exhibited both, remember from the previous slide, Sheshatvam and Paratantriyam. And this Paratantriyam, as Bharata had towards Ram, Shatrugna had towards Bharata, complete dependency. In this case, in his case, towards Bharata, the Lord's devotee. Oops. So, all this is, this is and the third, remember, Dasyatvam? That's possible when at the very, very root is this exclusive, being exclusively devoted to someone. So he had all three. This is Sri Vaishnava commentary. There's a document that you will or should have already received, and it has some of these details that I, we just covered in this slide. And if you want to go over it again, look at the document. It's just, I'm trying to share from my reading of Sri Vaishnava Acharyas, share with you their picture of 
who is Shatrugna? Where does he fit into the, you know, the, the puzzle of these different relationships? He's back to something we said a few classes ago. There's principles that are taught in scripture and then histories display it looks like this or it looks like that. It looks like the other thing. So they're exhibiting principles and then performing pastimes, which are very intriguing. Next, something that you've seen before, and I think we're going to see it again this evening at the temple, uh, the lineage of rakshasas. Because everything is within Krishna, Say it negatively. There's not something that exists that's not within Krishna. Say it, same thing. There's, there's only two things. There's Krishna and there's Krishnas. There's not a third thing. So for Krishna to, to, to assist Krishna in manifesting the cosmic manifestation, Brahma has a very important role. He does the work. But the, 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 the potency to do his work comes from the source of potencies, the source of everything. So when Brahma does the work, he, he doesn't just create good people, he creates demons too. Because there's variety in this world. And some people don't want to be devotees, they want to be demons. So Brahma has that un, uh, thankless task of creating demons. So here's a little lineage. And amongst those, this is how it's found in Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Brahma manifested a leader amongst the Rakshasas, whose name was Haiti. Haiti had a son, Vidyukesha, and Vidyutkesha had a son named Sukeshu, Sukesha. Sukesha's name we find in Valmiki Ramayana. So, Kesha. So, Kesha had three sons. N nice demons. Malyavan, those of you that have read Ramayana, you're very familiar with that name because he was, he was involved in, the, in Lanka. Malyavan was one of the ones that encouraged his grandson, Ravana to give Sita back because if you don't give Sita back it's going to it's going to bring destruction to the entire Rakshasa dynasty which it did Ravana wouldn't listen to his grandfather so Malyavan was his grandfather on his mother's side and Sumali was a brother of Malyavan in Mali According to 8th Canto Bhagavatam, all three were killed eventually by Vishnu. Now, at the lower left, there's Lavana, because Shatrugna is going to slay Lavana. So where, did, where was Lavana's father's name was Madhu, and his mother's name was Kumbashi, Kum, Kumbinashi, Kumbina, she was an unmarried daughter and he kidnapped her. Madhu kidnapped her. Madhu kidnapped Kumbina, she. We'll hear some more of the details. But this is just a chart to showing who's who and what's what and that kind of thing. She was the daughter of Malyavan's daughter, so granddaughter of Malyavan. And the daughter was Anala, and Anala married Vishvavasu, and Kumbi Nashi was their daughter. Madhu kidnapped her. And when Ravana heard that his cousin was kidnapped by Madhu, he went with humongous army to do battle with him.
Now let's go on the other side. There's, you, we heard this before, but we're hearing it again. There's Sumali. Sumali heard about this super duper powerful grandson of Lord Rama named Vishrava, a Brahmana named Vishrava. And Sumali heard about his power because Vishrava had as a son born of the daughter of Bharadraj Muni, he had a son who became put it in the post of Kuvera. So he, he thought, Somali thought, that, you know, here's this is a good idea. He's such a powerful personality. If my daughter, unmarried daughter, named Kaikashi, were to become his wife, then super rakshasas will be born of them. Because the sons take on the quality of or the designation, at least, of the mother. And she's a Rakshasi. And her husband, if her husband becomes... So he, Somali, sent his unmarried daughter, Kaikashi, to his ashram. And when she came, he was engaged in a yagya. And you all know, when you start a yagya, you don't interrupt the yagya. It's just like when you're chanting Gayatri, you don't do something else and then go back to chanting Gayatri. It's just it's, it's to be uninterrupted. So she just stood there scratching the ground with her toe while he was completing his yagya. He stayed focused on his yagya and as soon as the yagya was done, he turned to her and said, I know who you are and I know what your intention is and because I'm a Brahmin, I'm not going to reject your request, but I want you to know when children are born, they're going to be terrible, ferocious demons. And she said, no, 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 that's not what I want. And he said, because you came at an auspicious time, that's going to happen. But because you're appealing the way that you're appealing, then one, we'll hear about him this evening, one of your sons, the youngest of the, of the four children, will be very elevated spiritually, a qualified Brahmana like me, a great soul. So that's what happened. What happened was there were four children that were born of this combination. There's the reference from the Bhagavatam that describes similarly. And the firstborn son, Ravana. Second born son, Kumbhakarna. Third born daughter, Chirpanaka. And the fourth born son, Vibhishan. So now we're going to go back to the left hand side, lower left hand side. There's Madhu. We're going to hear a little bit more about him. Uh, he kidnapped the unmarried daughter of Anala. Anala, because that's the blood relation with Ravana. So Ravana's mother, Kaikashi, and Malyavan was Kaikashi's maternal uncle, and Kumbashini, Kumbani, Kum, Kumbinashi, she was the unmarried granddaughter of Malyavan, who was the uncle of Ravana's mother, Kaikashi. Then Madhu kidnapped her and married her. And when Ravana heard that this had happened, he, he brought his massive army to go do battle with Madhu. So just the blood relation is Ravana was the uncle of Madhu's son, Lavanasura. Lavanasura was the one that kill, was killed by Shatrugna, the slayer of enemies, Shatrugna. So here's a cut and paste from Ramayana. 
Kumbina, she was the unmarried granddaughter of Malyavan, the uncle of Ravana's mother, Kaikashi. When Ravana heard that Kumbinashi's abduction by Madhu, he flared with rage and prepared to kill the offender at once. He calling together all his Rakshas or chiefs, Ravana left Lanka. This is a really big number, 4,000 Akshohini divisions of soldiers. And the numbers of what makes up one is really humongous. But he had a plan after dealing with Madhu, he was going to go deal with the demigods. So, leading his army in the front, Meganada. Following behind, massive Kumbhakarna and Ravana personally entered the city to confront Madhu. And when he came into the city, his cousin, that's Kumbhinashi, who Ravana and Kumbhinashi were cousins, she came out of the city to speak to her cousin and she fell at his feet. And when she fell at his feet, Ravana somehow became soft-hearted and said, whatever it is that you want, you just ask and it's yours. No, no reason to be f afraid. This big army is not for you, it's for that person who kidnapped you. And she's now loyal to her, to Madhu. So her request was spare my husband because she knew how powerful was Ravana. Not that Madhu was not powerful, but she didn't want her, her husband to be killed. And so Ravana replied, yes, it would be show. Ask Madhu to come forward. I want him to come with me when I go to do battle with the demigods. So the battle with the demigods happened later. And he... In his army was his son, who later became renamed as Indrajit because Indrajit defeated Indra with his mystic powers, etc. So Kumbhinashi went to wake up her husband. Her husband woke up, and Ravana took Madhu along with his massive four thousand Akshohini divisions of soldiers. Now we're going to hear some more about Madhu and his characteristics. But the place in Ramayana where we find out about the problem with Lavanasura, it comes in a scene in the Uttarakhanda. Ramchandra is now fully installed as the king. And one of the things that good kings do is they have an appointed time where anybody in their kingdom, and this means anywhere in the world, someone can come with a complaint or a problem or some difficulty they're dealing with. And they can personally present it before the king. So Ram had an appointed time at that appointed time, the, someone was sent to the gate to see if there's anyone who's come to, to make some request of me as the king. And on one particular day, described in Ramayana, is there was no one there at the gate. Imagine if a president or head of state said, anybody in the whole can come and lodge a complaint. This was a different yuga. <laughs> there was nobody there. And so they came back and reported there's nobody there. Ram said, Lakshman, you go to the gate and see if there's anybody there. He went. The king came back. There's nobody there. He said, Ram, is there someone there? He said, there's a dog bashed and mashed. Looks horrible. There's a terrible dog. This happened to be a talking dog. Ramchandra said, bring him in. 
the dog didn't want to come in. I, I don't, I don't, it's not fit for me to be before the king. I'm a dog. Went to speak of bashed up features. Rob said, insisted he come. So the dog came. And <clears throat> Ramchandra asked the dog, what is it that I can do for you? And the dog began to explain, no, I, I, the sequence. How did you get your head so bashed in? And the dog said, there was a mendicant brahmana in your kingdom named Sarvata Siddha. And with a stick, he whacked me so hard, my head was broken. Right in the middle of the discussion, Ramchandra said, bring Sarvata Siddha right here. I want him to verify, did he do this? The Brahmana came and the Brahman acknowledged that he did it. And Ramchandra asked for an explanation. And the this is Valmiki Ramayana Uttarakanda. His explanation was, as a Brahmana, I was accepting alms here and there, but on one particular day, there were no alms being given. And I was famished and not in proper order of my mind. And this dog was standing right in the middle of the road, and I asked the dog to please move so I could pass on the, on the pathway. The dog didn't move. And in a fit of anger, I took a stick and bashed his head many, many times. Yes, I did it. I'm a Brahmin. I can't tell a lie. I lost my, got off control of my temper. So Ramachandra turned to the sages who were assembled there and heard the whole thing. And they, he asked the sages. He gives the names. Here's some very elevated sages. And what should be done? What's appropriate? And they said, he's a brahmana. You can't punish a brahmana. So we suggest you don't punish the brahmana. And then the dog spoke up and said, I have a recommendation. You can decide. The recommendation is, you please make him the chief priest at the Kalanjara Monastery. And they all looked at each other like, what? That's punishment? And Ram said, wait a minute, don't judge his decision. Let's ask him, why are you making this recommendation? It sounds like honor instead of punishment. And the dog said, in my previous life, I was the chief priest at Kalanjara Monastery. And because I had all these facilities and privileges and honor, I became very proud. Remember from yesterday? Fruits of piety plus a heart that's impure equals. Remember that one? You were here. You were with us, right? Math. You don't like math. But this is a math equation, different kind. And because I was proud, I also abused my position. And because of the position and abusing my position, in this life I took birth as a dog. And this Brahmana, Sarvata Siddha, he's already like that. And yet he's willing to accept the post of the chief priest of a monastery. He'll do himself in. We don't have to punish him. He'll take actions that will take care of, he'll become like me, he'll become a dog. Knowingly, Ram nodded. Make him the, the head priest of the monastery. Right in front of the Brahmana. And he accepted, even with, with that caution. <laughs> Sometime later, on another day, much to everyone's delight, Chavanamuni came. 
and Chavana Muni was living in the forest near a place known as Madhupuri. So when Chavana Muni came with a little entourage, he was invited in before Lord Ramachandra. And when he was requested, why have you come? What is it? What service can we do for you? He said, there's a demon named Labanasura who is harassing the rishis. And so I've come all the way to Ayodhya to seek protection. Please, I've understood that you've destroyed Ravana and compared to Ravana, Labanasura is small. So please do the needful. Ram looked around the room and said, surely I will take care of this. But would any of you, my brothers, like to have this service? Immediately Bharata spoke and said, I'd like to do that service. And after Bharata spoke, Shatrugna spoke. Shatrugna is this Sheshatvam, Bhagavata Sheshatvam towards Bharata. And he said, Bharatas had undergone so much trouble for 14 years, living, living like a mendicant outside the palace, and he's so much disturbed in his mind because of the circumstance. Let me do it. He shouldn't be troubled by this. And Ram said, very good. You do it. And then Shatrugna did a double take and said, oh, what have I done? I've overstepped Bharata. This is, you know, foolish and insolent. It was because of his mood of service to Bharata that he shouldn't have to trouble himself with going off to kill a demon. The Ramchandra corrected him, said, no, this is very good. You want to do service for Bharata and you want to do service for Chavana Muni. You're the servant of the, the servants. So this is very good. Let us conduct a ceremony where you are anointed the king of Lavanasura's kingdom, even before you go there. Something similar happened to Vibhishana. He was anointed the king even before they went to Lanka, right? You're not sure, but the answer is yes. So, Lavanas, they had... Shatrugna was made king. And so there was some discussion with Chavana Muni. Tell us a little bit about the strength of Lavanasura. And he described that in a previous yuga, his father, Madhu, had done some extensive austerities, Lord Shiva came before Madhu and Madhu was given an award of an invincible lance of Lord Shiva. The invincible lance was so powerful that it, two things, with that lance, it could he, he could defeat anyone and no one could defeat him. The lance of Lord Shiva. And when you use it, Immediately the lance will come back to your hand. You don't use it and lose it. You it'll be yours. So Madhu then requested, I'd like to give the lance to my son. And Lord Shiva said, No. It's for you. You give it back afterwards. And he pleaded and pleaded and pleaded and said, Okay, you can give it to your son. And the son of Madhu was Lavanasura, Invincible Lance. So this is all described, and it's going to be described again later by Chavanamuni. So Shatrugna was made the king of Madhuvan. Now, Madhuvan is a place in Vrindavan, right? One of the forests of Vrindavan, Madhuvan. You've heard of it? It's one of the forests of Vrindavan, Madhuvan, named after Madhu. And before it was 
Mathura, it was Madhupuri. Madhupuri, the place of Madhu, later became Mathura. So those of you that know a little bit of geography, we're in Ayodhya, and far west, and a little bit north is Mathura. So it's a big distance that Shavana Muni came all the way to Ayodhya to seek help. And the journey back was very significant. So after anointing him as king, Ramchandra made an arrangement that Shatruta could take with him 4,000 horse soldiers, 2,000 chariot warriors, 1,000 infantry, and 1 million gold coins because some expenditure needed to make this big thing happen. And the advice was repeated. He heard it. He's going to hear it again third time. Lavanasura has a habit to keep his lance inside his house or palace when he goes out to collect food because he was a rakshasa. So his food was just wild animals. So every morning for breakfast, with a different spear than this mystical spear, he would go kill wild animals. We'll hear some more, because that's what happened when uh, Shatrugna arrived. He leaves his mystical lance inside. So when you deal with him, deal with him in such a way that he doesn't have that lance. So that it's when he's gone out to get morning food. That's when you deal with him. Otherwise, it's invincible, and you have to confront him when he's outside his palace. So in, in the course of his travel, Shatrugna, with all of his soldiers, etc., etc., he, in the direction of Madhupuri, he happened to pass through the ashram of Valmiki. And it happened the very day that he arrived was when the two boys, the twin sons of Sita, were born. So he observed all the rituals that Valmiki performed, cleansing the, the bodies of the newborn children with kusha grass and mantras and this and that and the other thing. And he heard the, the name giving. Stayed a little bit of time and then he moved on. And when he moved on, then he went to the ashram of Chabanamuni. And he wanted to hear more from Chabanamuni about the prowess of Madhu and Lavanasura. So he was told by Chabanamuni long ago in the Ikshvaku dynasty, there was a powerful king named Mandata. And Mandata was so powerful that he had conquered the world. And he was thinking to then make his way to the heavenly realm. Indra got word he wants to come to the heavenly realm and do battle with us. So Indra visited Mandata and said, before you come here, you have to conquer the whole of the material world. And Mandata said, where is there a king that I haven't conquered? He said, in Madhupuri, there's a king you haven't conquered. Because Indra knew about the mystical weapon. So he went and confronted outside the palace, called for Madhu to come and do battle. That was a mistake, because Madhu brought the lance. He used the lance, and immediately Mandata and his whole army were destroyed. So Chavanamuni said it again. Don't approach Lavanasur, who received that same land from his father, when he's got the land in his hand. The only time is when he's going out in the morning. So it's like he's got his script. He understands the power of Lavanasura. Sure enough, when his entire army arrived at Madhupuri, he waited for the right time. And Lavanasura had went out with his spear to a very gory description of what was on the spear, elephant heads and boar heads and 
you know, this kind of wild animals on his long spear for his breakfast. And that's when Chitrugna confronted him. Stop. You're a wicked Rakshasa. You're disrupting the Rishis. I'm representing the king of Ayodhya. And this is part of our kingdom. And you have to stop this nefarious activity or engage in battle. And Lavanasura just laughed because he was very powerful and very proud. And they did battle, you know, the interesting battle description. And Lava, the Lavanasura took a tree trunk and whacked the side of the head of Chitrugna, and he fell to the ground. He thought he's finished. He laughed and went inside to get his spear. But as he went inside to get his spear, Chitrugna came to external consciousness, awoke, and challenged him, don't be a coward, turn and fight. And when he turned to fight, Chitrugna, with the special weapons that Ramachandra had given him, finished him. Lavanasur was killed by Chitrugna. And then other soldiers came out of the palace to take revenge against the death of their leader, Lavanasura. They were all destroyed. And then again, because it was now formalized, Chitrugna was made the king of Madhupuri and of the second ceremony right in Madhupuri. And he, along with all of his soldiers and everything, they ruled there for a long time because you don't just go and kill Lavanasura and leave the place abandoned. He ruled in Madhupuri for 12 years. And after ruling in Madhupuri for 12 years, he was feeling separation from Ayodhya and Ramachandra and his two brothers, three brothers. And so he left. Someone in charge he left to go visit Ramachandra in Ayodhya. And on his way, he again passed through Valmiki's ashram. Twelve years later, these young babies were now young boys, 12-year-old boys. We saw this, right? We saw some pictures. He trained them in everything and everything and everything and everything. And one of the things that he trained them in was singing Ramayana with musical instruments and Shatrugna was so charmed and inspired by their musical performance and their reciting of Ramayana that he requested Valmiki, please, can we bring, we, we discussed this in relation to Sita. That's where we discussed it. That, let them come with you to Ayodhya, so they did. Vilmiki agreed. And the performance took place and all this thing happened. And then Shatrugna wanted to remain. And he said, you're the king. You have, to, you have to protect your citizens. You're the king. So you return. From time to time, you can come visit. But you must remain. So he went back to Madhupur. In this connection, that's a little bit about Lavanasura. In this connection, there's another scene in that whole section of Ramayana where others can come forward. And uh, if there's some problem, they can express their problem to the king. So one day, uh, a Brahmana came to lodge a complaint. And the complaint was, my son, who was 14 years old, just died. And in our kingdom, who has heard of such a thing, that the son, a young son, will die before his father? That means there's discrepancy and the part of the ruler, because otherwise such a thing would not happen to a qualified brahmana. So Ramchandra was very surprised. He 
uh, consulted his ministers, why has this happened? The explanation was given that there's a shudra in your kingdom named Shambhuka, who is engaged in horrific austerities. And in these horrific austerities, that was the cause, this discrepancy in Dharma was the cause of the Brahmana's son dying prematurely. He said, if, if, if you don't deal with this, if you can't bring my son back, then I'll sit in front of your palace door and fast till death. It was like challenge and your reputation be ruined. So, He, the minister, he asked, Ramchandra asked the ministers, what is to be done? As the king, you have to deal with this because it's in violation of dharma. It caused the death of a brahmana's son. It's going to cause more havoc. See, here's a painting or an illustration. There's Shambhuka hanging upside down from a tree over a fire. That's pretty austere. A little different than Hirani Kashipu. And sure enough, what Ramachandra did was he chopped Shambhuka's head. And, you know, this is one of those incidents that um, sometimes people say the, the, the position of Ramachandra as being the ideal king who always follows Dharma, Maryada Purushottama. How can you chop a Shudra's head because he's a Shudra and he chops his head because he's doing austerities? And in the, one of the documents you should have received is a very detailed explanation in um, the writings of Madracharya because this incident is not only in Valmiki Ramayana, it's in other places, including Mahabharata. And he describes that this Shudra was not just killed because he was performing austerities. His, he had a very specific objective. His very severe tapasya was to take the position of Lord Shiva, to become the enjoyer of Parvati, and to destroy the world, because that's a rudra function. That was his intention. And that had to be checked. And for that reason, it was checked. He had to be stopped. So sometimes force is needed, sometimes very strong action is needed by a qualified king. You know, and for most of us with sensibility, that's like yikes or yuck, or how can, how can something like that happen? But there's dharma principles that are to be known and fight qualified kings to be followed. He wasn't acting independently. He was acting under the guidance of the brahmanas because he was a person that needed to be checked. There wasn't any discussion. Something like what Hanuman did with Simhika. There wasn't a discussion. He just finished her because of her disposition and he knew what her disposition was. So he finished her. No discussion. So that's the conclusion of this little presentation on Shatrugna. And he has a role, two things. He has a role to play in his relationship with Ramachandra specific to his relationship with Bharata because he's the servant of the servant. And with these three characteristics, he's, he's in a very exalted position from a Vaishnava point of view. And then this other principle is <coughs> the principle of a king it's not just to get the position or post, but in some cases, kings have to deal very strongly with situations. 
like this example with the dog, he didn't have to do much because the dog figured it out. But, you know, it has to be just and fair, not just strong. And that here's, it's not easy to do that. One has to be very wise. And wise people that do things wisely are generally guided by wise people or qualified brahmanas. So qualified kshatriyas, qualified brahmanas, that's not a description of Kali Yuga. So we have so many, so many anomalies of what to do. And according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, what to do is the light of the Bhagavat, because in this dark age of Kali, one can get light from Srimad Bhagavatam. That's you know exactly the answer given in Canto 1, Chapter 3, towards the end of Chapter 3. The Srimad Bhagavatam appeared in this world of this age of Kali to give light in this dark age of Kali for, so people can see and people can, by its message, become purified and be properly guided by the words of the Bhagavatam and then ideally by qualified representatives, the Bhagavatas, the person in the book Bhagavata. So we need the guidance of both the book and the person, the devotee of the Lord. That's what to do. So let's see if there's some discussion. During the Muslim rule period, although their faith or their, their religion was Muslim, they loved Ramayana. There are many, 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 many paintings by Muslim artists depicting scenes from Ramayana. They loved Ramayana. And it's okay. I mean, it's not like they shouldn't love Ramayana. It wasn't in conflict with their teachings. It just was such a glorious way to, to narrate the pastimes of the Supreme Person. Anything? No, okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, there's a, there's a document that you can read through that explains, Madhvacharya explains, it's not just that he was doing austerities. The purpose of his austerity was diabolical. I, I, I'm not familiar enough to say yes or no. I could say probably. <laughs> but I, there are persons I know that are much more familiar with Ramayana than I am, and I'll find out. I'll Thank let you, you know tonight. Thank you, Hopefully. Does anybody in the room know the answer to that question? Okay. Yes. Oh. Dasya. Dasya. Dasya Tvam. Then one of the things was also when you explained about 
when we are doing service, Vicky quickly mentioned about that, that you want to do the service, but sometimes you also kind of very careful about not stepping on toes. Yeah. On others. But that's just something like very much you have to be so self-aware all the time because you Well, it, you don't have to be serve. catatonic and you can't take a step because you might step on some toes. You You have to become refined through service and purification to know where the toes and how to not step on toes while doing your service. Supposing you step on toes unknowingly. Supposing you do it knowingly. That's different than unknowingly. Supposing unknowingly. There's the course correction from Krishna from within. We're not alone in service. The Krishna factor is there to help us. The motive is really to increase the quality, right? Yeah. Also, well, the, the motive is increased Krishna's pleasure or the, the object of our service that they should be pleased. That's the, um, object, that's the goal. And, you know, try to refine that goal because, because we're mixed. We're not pure. That's the position of pure. And we're not there yet. So we're going to make mistakes. We'll, you know, pray to Krishna to cover our backside or, you know, you know, correct us from within, not just so we don't get spanked, but correct us from within so we can make wise decisions and make the, execute those wise decisions properly. It takes a while. Maturity takes a while, but this from the seed, the, the mature plant and tree and flowers and fruits and everything can come. Maturity is required. Purity and maturity. Yes? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much uh, for the class. And uh, because we are do, dealing with Vaishnava Prats for all these sessions of Ramayana, so uh, there was one question which I thought about uh, yesterday evening after hearing a class is that if uh, some the expectations from other devotees when we have friends friendships with other devotees and then there is some expectation that in tough times or in the good times you have uh, you know some help or cons consolation and if that doesn't come by so sometimes our my my heart at least feels like we've been hurt or betrayed. Uh, but these expectations were set by me. Yes. So then does it like, I am hurt definitely, but then... That's a material uh, emotion. Now, how do you deal with material emotions? You spiritualize those material emotions. Amanitvam adamvitvam. Humility and pridelessness or, you know, without expectation. So we're not there yet. So now when you have those emotions, step back from the emotion and ask, where's this coming from? Rather than just get caught up in the emotion. There's a movie that's called The Mind. <laughs> and the, the events of life are looked at like a movie is looked at, but it's not the events of life, it's just the mind. Now, supposing, supposing this is something that I do regularly. If Prabhupada was in the, this situation, how would he respond? How, how would a pure devotee respond? So I'm, it's not my autobiography, it's the, from the lens of pure devotion. How would Prabhupada respond? And, you know, you don't necessarily know the answer to that question, but it's going to be different than my response. So just recalibrate and align the emotion with pure devotion, at least in, in directionally. And that, that has some impact on the, the emotion that you're feeling, betrayed, etc. So, so just not, redirect the emotion towards pure devotion. So and, and there's then there's other principles. Let me not get caught up in the movie. Let me maintain my position of being the servant of the servant. 
And then, you know, the higher position, Krishna, you can do with me what you like. And, you know, tongues to Tiksha Swabharata. So you go to scriptural sources, you go to the place of orienting your heart's expectation towards pleasing Krishna. And this other has nothing to do with pleasing Krishna. It's me at the center, not Krishna at the center. So you hit the reset button. And it does something to the emotion. And the direction of the flow, it's not that the emotion becomes zero, but the flow of the emotion moves in the direction of how can I be of service? A better servant so I don't get caught up in this degrading emotion, embarrassing emotion. Just one more. So, uh, so after you like you know, assessing the emotions and everything, we've already committed the crime. Uh, uh, not necessarily. If it's a mental offense, it's not. It's not as severe as you bark or you hit or something. So, There's consequence, but the consequence is that. Then what do you do with that consequence? You. The, According to Bhakti Mano Thakur, a tapa for a Vaishnava is regret. Tapa is purifying. And don't just you know continue beating yourself up and beating yourself up and beating yourself up. That's tamagun. I I've got this lower t nature tendency, and I, it's not becoming of a Vaishnava. So you, you, it, it, it can intensify your shelter taking of Krishna. Please pick me up from this dark place and feeling these self-centered feelings. Because in, in, in the final analysis, not about this, this. I was asked to send somebody the Mother Teresa quote. No, in her conclusion, the Mother Teresa quote is, in the final analysis, not between you and them. It's, it's between you and God anyways. So you, you know, be conscious, and it takes away the negative emotion. So Maharaj, uh, till, till that point where we are assessing our emotions, and that's why we are looking through this eyes of Shastra, yes. so that we can do yes. it for Krishna. Yes. So then there are some devotees who have heard that, you know, because we don't know where the line of, you know, exploitation starts. And then, you know, these emotions should, you know, be reassessed. So then how are we, like, not getting exploited at the same time we are doing... Don't worry about it. Be in, be in the mood of service and, and Krishna will protect you. If somebody wants to exploit you, 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 you be thoughtful. I mean, Prabhupada was thoughtful when somebody, you know, without anecdotal examples, when people were trying to exploit him, he stepped back. There's a nice example in that. Did, did you receive that recording of Daivi Shakti's talk about the establishing of the Vrindavan temple? Okay, go check it out. One of the things that happened, Prabhupada was interviewing two teams of pujaris to install the deities. So one team came from South India, really gifted brahmanas. They described what they wanted to do, she, her narration, and Prabhupada liked what they wanted to do, and he was fine. Then he offered them prasadam, and they refused to take prasadam. And then her Dave, Daivi Shakti's narration, I don't know how she knew this, but she said, Prabhupada then understood their, their motive was install the deities. These foreign people, they're not qualified at all. We've installed the deities, but so therefore the temple is ours. Whatever dakshin comes to the deity, we'll take the dakshin to the deity and take over. So he decided not to go with that group of pujaris simply because they wouldn't take prasadam. He didn't bark. He just didn't go with them. He made a decision based upon sign, a symptom, a lakshana. Yes, no, we make decisions, but we don't hold ill will. Just be careful. 
when you're moving through the minefield. Thank you, man. Yes. I said a simple question. Did uh, Sardugna had any kids? Say it again. Sardugna, did, did he have any kids? Children? Shatrugna did what? Did he kill Madhu? Did he have any children? I don't know. I'm not a Ramayana scholar, but I have friends. And there are some friends who are Ramayana scholars. So I can ask. You're going to remind me of these. There's This is the second one. One is, did Shatrugna have any children? And the first one I forget already. Yeah, did the Brahmin boy come back to life? I think you're right, but I can't remember. I, think I have read, uh, I have read in some books. Well, some authentic book. Okay, that's a good adjective. <laughs> but I'll do a little research, and hopefully before, uh, you know, by the evening program, I can report to everybody the answer to these two questions. Yes? Maharaj Hare Krishna. About the, that uh, sesa, two sesa came same time. Like one is uh, Satrugan and another, another is uh, Lakshmana. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. Both sesa is same Yes, but just that means Lord Balaram. Is it where is it applied? Is the distinction one is towards the supreme Lord, the other is to the devotee of the supreme Lord? So now your question is: Question is in Chaitanya Charitamrita mention about that Lord Narayana alone and Lord Balaram became Ananta says yeah. and he phone he Janya of the prayers yeah. whatever the thing yeah everything is serving that means. Other rest of the three, Bharat, Satruna, and all that, like yeah. You know, yeah. Balaram, yeah, and it's all finally is the same. Oh, absolutely the same, okay. and there's difference within the absolutely the same. The same. Okay. There's variety within the absolute. Same time servicing Satruna to the Bharat. It's just the detail of the yes. mode of service. That's all. But the mode of service is the same. To serve the servant of the supreme, or to serve the to serve the the Vaishnava, and to serve the supreme Lord, is the Vaishnava's life. So serve the Vaishnava, and you're serving the supreme Lord. It's the same. Another thing, see, the Prabhuji asking question. I heard one. I am not sure, but in the Sati Yoga, if we are thought some bad thing, yes, or something, this you're responsible. Uh, Sinful things. It's only. Uh, Hundred percent have to uh, uh, purify by going to austerity and treta and yeah, yeah, yeah. in kali yoga by mind only twenty five percent something like that. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> this effect. I have not seen it, but I must. I've heard that also. I don't know any shastra that supports that. I've heard it many times. Understanding. I've be I've become a little bit cautious about making statements that. I don't know the shastra behind it, and so I'm cautious. You can, you know, it's make it soft. I heard somewhere. <laughs> that, that's the reason I'm not sure. I, I'm I, also I want not to sure. sure I've you. heard the same thing you've heard, but I, I don't know the shastra, praman. So let's move on. So Maharaj, it looks like Shatrugna was engaged, like a little bit engaged, right? With love and Kosh, like he was able to visit them twice. Twice. Are there any mention of like if, if Lakshman or Bharat, anybody else was able to go there? No. no. Because he went and he came back. And they were with, with Ram. Ram didn't go. So Lakshman didn't go. Shatrugna went. No. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. One question on uh, what you mentioned on Friday evening. I think you mentioned that um, Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita for Hanuman. No, that's, that's Madhvacharya. Yeah, Madhvacharya. So I was curious on the background of why that came upon or why did Hanuman need that instruction? Why did he? Did, he didn't need anything. It's just, you know, the disposition, the orientation of Madhvacharya's heart towards Hanuman, the son of Vayu, as he was a partial incarnation of Vayu. So he has, he's partial towards Hanuman. And Bhima, too. It's just Madhvacharya. And his commentary is very consistent. All the way in the back. So, if you serve the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, you're serving the Lord. That's right. So you don't. So if you have that in your home, and that's what you're doing darshan to, yeah, in the morning, you don't have to have. A figurine of a deity. Of course, you you absolutely right. Let me let me t add to what you just said. This is a, a Prabhupada story. Once upon a time, in the beginning, there weren't deities. What Prabhupada called was a Guru Garanga altar. And one of the things that he wanted, the artists that wanted to serve Prabhupada is a whole group of artists began making Panchatattva paintings. Panchatattva, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, paintings, oil paintings. And then the framed oil painting would go on the altar, the Guru, Prabhupada, Guru Garanga. He, that's what he we called it, or he called it, Guru Grunk Altar. Some time passed, and then deity worship began. And when deity worship began, it was a whole wave that, let, let's go get some deities. So different places where there was Sangha, they, with permission of Prabhupada, they got deities, commonly Gornatai, or Jagannath Baladev Subhadra, commonly. L let me finish, let me finish the story. So then some time passed, and then Prabhupada began beating the drum and blaring the trumpet, book distribution, book distribution, book distribution. And so many of us, I was one of those, many, we got in a van and loaded up the van literally to the ceiling and waddled down the highway, distributing books at this place, that place, the other place. And then after some time, because the deity worship was becoming very popular, a letter went to Prabhupada. I didn't send the letter. Someone wrote a letter. Should we have deities when we're doing this traveling sankirtan, book distribution? And Prabhupada's answer was your answer. The books are your deity. Okay, so you're on board. Somewhere. Yeah, there's nice stories like that. There's nice stories like that. Well, let me just amplify my response to your response to my response to your response. Not so long ago, somebody asked me, somebody asked me, do you, do you, do you engage in deity worship? And my answer was, the books are my deity. From that brahmachari training period where the books are our deity. 
So that's what's inside and that's what's outside because that, that very simple instruction. Now, in principle, the book is Krishna and the deity is Krishna. So whether it's the book or, or the deity, the book is Krishna and the deity is Krishna. It's just what, which, which, you know, someone may like this and somebody may like that. There's, there's certainly benefit for both. And there's particular instruction in the books for householders, it's especially important. But I'm not a householder. So, you know, I, I, and I, love, I love Prabhupada's books, so I'm, I'm perfectly satisfied. I'm not feeling I'm being deprived or I've become depraved or something like that. I'm fine. And you too, so just be happy. Okay. You're okay. Now you're relieved. Anything else? Yes. Ah. The name also here. Oh, nice. Yeah, names also. Yeah, Lakshmana, Bharata, and two sons. Angada and Chanuka, Sambhakirti, and. Uh, could you do me a favor? Send me the reference. Not right now. Oh, okay. Later, you send me. You know how to contact me, right? Find out how to contact me. You send it to her and she'll send it to me. Anything else? Okay, good. And you two guys, anything? Do you like these talks? It's okay? Or you, you get restless and you wish it was over? <laughs> A little bit of both. Be honest. But? <laughs> A little boring? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me, let me respond to the, it's a little boring. Why are we here? You know, even more specific, why are you here? You can say, I'm here because mom and dad want me to be here. And, you know, I don't want to displease mom and dad, so I'm here. But I'm not really fully here because it's a little boring. So when you're in that space, and it may, you know, it may last for some time, I don't know. It may change, I don't know. But the, the benefit is just by hearing there's heart cleansing. I may not be like, I'm here because I want my heart to become clean, but it happens. Let's go the other direction. In a culture that doesn't hear, what happens? They hear something else. And when you hear something else, what happens? The mind spins. I'm going to give two little stories, but then I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. In the past two weeks, I met two very elderly ladies. One of them was in Austin, Texas, and um, she didn't speak so much English. She was from a Brahmin family, and I didn't, you know, as I was describing some pastime of Brahmayana, Every now and then, over there in the room, I heard this sound. She was responding because she recognized the picture. She couldn't understand English, but she was sitting through the whole thing because she likes Ramayana, Mahabharata, and Srimad Bhagavatam so much. Since so, at the end, after all of you know that noise that she was making, I, her daughter said, from when we were little children. And even now with grandchildren, my grandmother will sit, will sit with us, my mother, now her, the grandchildren will sit, and every day we would hear Ramayana and Mahabharata with, 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 her, with my mother. And the, you know, the mother was, by her facial features, very composed. She didn't understand what it was saying because it was, it was second language. 
So I, and then I asked the, the daughter, she said, we're from the Yadav family, of Brahmanas from the Yadu dynasty. So I said, ask, ask your mother, what's her favorite part of Ramayana? Immediately, no hesitation. Her, mo her mother came with this eloquence. She had, the daughter had to translate in English. But every part of it is like nectar. And there's no part of it that I like better than another because it's all like nectar. It's all very wonderful. So that was like coming from her heart. Now, how did that happen? Just from hearing and 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 with her daughter. Now, that so it went in with her daughter and then the, and the grandchildren. So you may be a little restless, but it's having an effect anyways. The more you could become inclined, that's your good fortune. And if it's not so inclined, it's still good fortune. Then in another circumstance, someone that's, you know, in their 80s came to see me and da 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 da, -da and she heard that I was speaking on Ramayana and she said, when, when we were little children, our grandmother every day for two hours just read Ramayana. And so it's like inside. So that may not be your intention. I, I want my, my heart to be virtuous. But when there's an absence of hearing the emblem of virtue, Maryada Purushottama, Rama, then virtue is missing in your life and, and th those around you. And therefore, you, you, you are very fortunate to be young enough to hear this when you're young. Even it's, you're, it's not like, it's interesting, but it's not really absorbing. It's, it's beneficial culturally, emotionally, spiritually. <laughs> And one, one final thing. When that enters into your heart, then you're protected from the madness of the raging Kali Yuga going all over the place. You may not recognize it, but at in, in some point in time, you'll recognize it. That it's a crazy world. And it's not getting saner. It's get it, it, it. The wildness is completely wild, and you're protected. Although it, you're you know, a little bored, not fully present, but you know the, the, the benefit is going in anyways. And you'll understand what I just said more as you get older and you'll understand more about how you're, you're being protected just by hearing in this, this situation that we're in right, right now. Just hearing and slowly hearing. You know, there's details. And it, there are details. Are, the storyline is very intriguing, but it's, it's far more intriguing than Harry Potter. And it's not only that, it's purifying. It's not just spin your mind. Okay, enough. I'd like to end. Shiva Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. So, big thank you to His Holiness Ramabhad Swami for a wonderful class again today. Please give me a big round of applause. I'd also like to thank uh, Nikita and Sankir Prabhu for hosting this morning's program. And and thank you all for taking time off on a Sunday morning to come to the program. Really appreciate it. And we have another program this evening. Aarti is at 5 o'clock at the temple. 5.30 we have a class. And today's topic is going to be Vipishan Surrender. And that's the last uh, topic of the series uh, this time. But Maharaj has a lot of uh, really nice uh, uh, videos on the YouTube as well regarding the personalities of uh, Ramayana. And you can 